Hi everyone, thanks for joining today. We're just waiting for a few more people to join and then we'll get started. Great, uh, so we're back. Before we begin today, uh, could everyone just let us know in the chat window if you can hear okay? Thank you very much. So, welcome to today's webinar entitled Revolutionizing the Agency Landscape with Social Data. We are going to go through an awful lot of use cases for agencies to uh, leverage social intelligence today. But before we get into the content section of our broadcast, just like to let you know, feel free to type your questions in the question window throughout the webinar, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. You can also follow the conversation on Twitter and ask any questions after the fact at Synthesio. Uh, and if we don't have time to get to your question, we'll be sure to follow up after the webinar. Thank you again, everyone, for joining, and we will now get into our presentation. So my name is Greg Roth. I'm the VP of Global Marketing here at Synthesio, uh, and I'm going to be joined today by David Parkinson, who is a co-founder of Brave and Heart. Uh, Dave used to be the head of digital at uh, Nissan in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, uh, as well as India, where he first got his first experience working with Synthesio and developing key global KPIs and implementing social and online listening globally to support uh, Nissan's needs. So before we get to David's uh, guest speaking section of the broadcast, I'm going to walk you through a bunch of different uh, use cases for social intelligence that agencies can leverage in order to win business, support clients, uh, do some research on product launches, uh, potentially market uh, to their customers. So here's our agenda for today. We will walk through how agencies build social infrastructure, then go through some use cases for sales, accounts, and marketing activation for uh, how to leverage social intelligence, uh, and then talk about how we can cohesively roll social intelligence out across the enterprise uh, agency. And then David will join us to talk about best practices for global agencies, uh, and we will take your questions uh, at the end of the broadcast. So, We'll jump right into it here. How do agencies build social infrastructure? If you uh, attended our last webinar around six weeks ago, we talked an awful lot about how organizations uh, build a social infrastructure. And in that presentation, we concentrated primarily on enterprise brands. And the four common types of social organizations we discussed were the autonomous collective, the collaborative hub, the social socket, and the global enterprise matrix. Each one of these different types of social organizations uh, will leverage social intelligence in different ways. But one of the things you can notice from this slide is that the social socket and the global enterprise matrix are defined by the fact that they have a social intelligence owner sitting at the center of their organization, whereas the autonomous collective and the collaborative hub are basically leveraging social intelligence in silos. So when we move to the next slide, you can see that uh, most agencies are working in a project-based format when it comes to social intelligence. They have different departments across the agency, whether they're sales, accounts, PR, analytics, product, marketing activation. And in most general cases, uh, our clients who are agencies are plugging social intelligence into these specific disciplines without a centralized owner to share intelligence across the organization. Now this works incredibly well for many agencies because they are project-based in general. So when you're trying to win an account in sales, you can use social intelligence to inform your pitch. When you're trying to maintain clients and accounts, you can use social intelligence to gauge brand health, benchmark against the competition. Public relations can use social intelligence to monitor and react to crisis. Marketing activation can use social intelligence to segment audiences. Analytics can push social intelligence data into their business intelligence tools so they can crunch numbers against other digital platforms. And product innovation can really uh, put their finger on the pulse of their consumers and their audience to figure out what they like about a brand, what they like about a product, and what they don't like about a product. Now, the interesting thing here is that all of these things live in silos, 
But what I'm going to try to get to by the end of the broadcast is to convince you that a central owner is going to do more value to your agency when it comes to social intelligence because you will be able to use the intelligence that you're searching for across different departments within the organization. Before we get to that, though, what I'll do is go through a few of these silos so that you can begin to imagine exactly how social intelligence might exist within your agency organization. And the first one is obviously the most uh, basic and the most obvious, which is using social intelligence to uh, leverage audience data to drive insightful sales pitches. So uh, all of you in the agency world out there know that you're in a constant cycle of pitching business. You're always looking for new ways to win new accounts, uh, whether it's a creative business, a media business, uh, or an all-purpose agency. You're always looking to, to you know, score that big client name, that big brand name, so that you can put it up on your masthead. Now, when it comes to sales, um, one of the great things about social intelligence is it will set your presentation and your pitches apart from the competing agencies that are also trying to win these brands because you're going to be able to come in with more than just ideas for creative or more than just data to show them in spreadsheets. What you'll be able to do is start to show uh, these potential clients what people are talking about, what is causing spikes and dips in the volume of conversation, how have past campaigns performed, and what audience in general embraces the brand. So the uh, brand that I used for my example here is Snickers, probably the most uh, popular candy bar in the United States. So that was kind of a no brainer in terms of, you know, how do people feel about Snickers? But what we wanted to see when we started to dig into brand mentions around this candy bar was what else are people talking about? What are they talking about when they talk about Snickers? So in taking a look at this slide here, you can see a word cloud at the top. The word cloud represents the most commonly used words in mentions about Snickers. And one of the things that really, really was interesting here is you begin to drill into these words, you can see that when people post about different uh, things, they are using kind of a common thread when it comes to this brand. So for instance, a lot of people posting about advertising, when they're posting about Snickers advertising, they're posting about the commercials. So Snickers very uh, well known for their Super Bowl ads, for the current campaign where you're not yourself until you have a Snickers. Lots of people sharing those ads. Now, the kind of opposite end of the coin in terms of engagement is recipes. So while people are proactively posting versions of the Snickers ads online, they're really not garnering that much interaction, much interest, that many comments because it's just basically a reposting of a commercial. When it comes to recipes and emotions, this is where, you know, Snickers mentions really shine. So people are looking for new ways to enjoy their favorite treats. And this absolutely provides a wonderful amount of market intelligence for the Snickers brand as they begin to be able to determine what flavor combinations people are particularly passionate about, uh, what, what types of recipes are they posting. So what this allows them to do is really get some market research on potentially uh, new flavor combinations, new products, whether they be ice cream products or cake products. So it gives them an opportunity to, to uh, expand out their brand presence beyond the original product. In addition to all of this social intelligence that we're getting, we're also getting market intelligence from their competitors. So you can see that uh, pulling in information from Reddit will allow us to see that uh, Mars, uh, which makes Twix, announced a 250 calorie cap on all single serve confectionery. So we're getting kind of market intelligence from the field about the size of candy bars and how they're changing. And then we can see how people would react to that size change in candy bars as a lot of people were complaining that they can't find full-size candy bars at the checkout aisle anymore. What causes spikes and dips in volume? Uh, obviously, campaigns are going to have a huge impact on spikes and dips in volume. Now, what we found to be most interesting here is obviously when Snickers runs an April Fool's Day uh, prank, new Knickers from Snickers, we see our largest spike in mentions for the month. Lots of people sharing the fake ad, lots of people laughing along with it. But that previous spike that occurred before April 1st, 
was actually kind of uh, interesting as well, because we start to see people talking about uh, the Pepsi ad that uh, went out uh, with Kendall Jenner in relation to Snickers. So we're seeing a little kind of cross-contamination from another crisis over here. So this is really uh, insightful market intelligence around Snickers in terms of how to separate yourself as a brand from the advertising that uh, potential partners or uh, other players in your space are doing that might be creating controversy. We can also see how past campaigns perform. So I mentioned here that you can see these spikes in the volume graph here, and you can see obviously that uh, April 1st spike due to uh, the April Fool's Day prank. But one of the other things that you might miss out here on is how have past campaigns perform. So Snickers has a partnership with the WWE, the World Wrestling uh, Entertainment uh, Organization, and they run an awful lot of custom made uh, ads and commercials and sponsorship promos during WWE broadcasts. And one of the things that you can see is that uh, on the 12th, when they ran a commercial with The Miz, uh, it made this Dale Burke's night. Yet the commercials that they ran with other WWE superstars as we got into uh, May, May 3rd did not generate the same amount of volume. So this gives Snickers a really great idea as to which wrestlers within WWE they should feature in their future commercials because they're able to determine who's generating the most amount of noise. Last but not least is what audience embraces the brand. So with Synthesio's platform, what you can do is really filter down to begin to understand what is making up this audience here. So, you know, while you might be able to drill down to see how many people in Houston are talking about Snickers that might not do you any good. But if you start to combine these demographics, uh, how many people in males in Houston between the ages of 25 and 34 uh, are fans of music or are fans of video games? So looking at geographic locations, demographic information and affinities will allow you to better target your content in the future. If you have determined that tons and tons of your Snicker fans like pets then it might make sense to feature animals in a future commercial. Same goes with video games, same goes with music. So while you're running your existing campaigns, you're also gathering intelligence to inform your future campaigns. When it comes to accounts, uh, we're talking about things a little bit differently. So with sales, you're looking to share market intelligence, social intelligence to help you win a pitch. You're coming in to a potential client and you're trying to show them that you're smarter and you have more tools at your disposal, uh, but you're really only glancing across the surface of social intelligence on a pitch as you show some screenshots of mentions or some data. When you get into accounts, you're really going to get uh, knee deep into social intelligence because now you're managing your existing clients. You don't want those clients to churn you want to be able to provide the uh, best possible value out of a social intelligence program. The example that I used uh, were appliance makers, concentrating primarily on Whirlpool. Now, if you're an agency and Whirlpool is your client, you're going to want to know how much people are talking uh, about your brand and how much they're talking about your brand in relation to your competing brands. What causes those spikes and dips in volumes? What is it about the qualitative mentions that could potentially impact the bottom line? And then how can we learn from our competitors' successes or failures in the past? So when it comes to benchmarking clients against competing brands and products, you obviously want to know how much people are talking and then how much they're talking in relation to your competing brands. So you can see very uh, quickly at a quick glance at this uh, series of charts here is that Whirlpool is generating the highest amount of volume amongst the competitive set that's made up of GE, LG, and Maytag. Now, what we did here was we tracked not just these brand names, but also the specific appliances that they make. And when you look at share of voice here, you're thinking, wow, Whirlpool is really winning the game. But when you look a little bit closer at qualitative mentions, you get an idea that there's an abnormally large amount of Whirlpool products for resale on secondhand sites. So a more normalized trend line is what's healthy in a stable market like this that doesn't really rely on flashy advertising campaigns and a ton of social advertising. So that 
uh, large amount of share of voice and that uh, yellow line on the topics timeline representing the volume over time, while at first glance might show you good things, when you look deeper, you might realize that that volume might not necessarily be to your advantage. Also, when looking at the sentiment here, you can see that LG, who has the third highest share of voice, also has the highest amount of negative sentiment. So this gives you an opportunity to drill into that negative sentiment and see why people are unhappy with their LG appliances. So benchmarking also uh, is about how healthy is my brand? So how healthy are they overall in basically a bubble? And then how healthy are they in comparison to the competition? And then how healthy is each individual product? So in looking at social reputation score, this is a uh, Synthesio proprietary metric that we use to gauge brand health. And this metric is derived from a combination of uh, volume as well as sentiment. So in looking at the brand competitive set, you don't see very much differentiation between LG at the top and Maytag at the bottom. This is a very stable score for brand health for the appliance industry. We would expect to find them in this range of around 50 out of 100. Now, when you're looking deeper at Whirlpool, you look at the SRS for each one of the product uh, lines, whether it's uh, ranges, washer, dryers, microwaves, etc. And you can see again that there's really not all that much differentiation in the SRS scores of each one of these uh, product lines. However, in looking closer at the share of voice and the share of uh, sentiment for each one of these things, you might begin to discover that refrigerators are gathering the most share of voice, whereas microwaves are gathering the smallest share of voice. So this is gonna give you a little bit of intelligence on how to start to promote products that people are not talking about. So another thing that you can get to the bottom of here is ranges generating a very small amount of share of voice, but uh, a proportionately large amount of uh, positive sentiment. So people are really liking the ranges. Maybe that's why they're not talking about them. On the flip side of the coin here, washer dryers are generating the hard, largest amount of negative sentiment. And when you drill into those mentions, you see an awful lot of information about product recalls and problems that people are having with those washers and dryers. So that's information that could be passed along to your PR team to manage that crisis. Speaking about that crisis, what can impact the bottom line? So we, we took a cursory glance at our sentiment uh, and we saw that our largest amount of negative sentiment was occurring around our washers and dryers. And I mentioned when you drill deeper into the qualitative mentions, you begin to see some major problems that could be impacting Whirlpool's bottom line. Obviously, as I mentioned, there's a parliamentary petition calling for the recall of Whirlpool uh, dryers in the UK as they are a fire risk. But in addition to that kind of global crisis problem, we have these mini crisis problems where customers are complaining on a daily basis about their washers and dryers. The motors are dying. They're getting poor customer service. And in fact, this is a great way to uh, monitor the customer service that's being provided through your own channels. As you can see, people are not very happy with the way that Whirlpool is handling their complaints through digital channels. So again, something that can impact the bottom line, something that could be passed off to a marketing team to help uh, craft these messages that might go out to customers and also great learnings for your customer care team as you are able to aggregate all of the responses to, your, uh, to, to any types of complaints and begin to see trends in what people are complaining about. Last but not least when it comes to Whirlpool, how do we help Whirlpool learn from the competition? So what we're looking at here are some awareness charts. And what awareness charts are showing you are not just your share of voice, uh, but your reach across channels and where that reach is distributed. So when you look on the left, you could see all four of our primary brands and their distribution of media across channels. We obviously see LG has the highest reach, uh, whereas Maytag has the lowest reach. Now, what can we learn from these things as a brand like Whirlpool? Well, when we look closer at LG and GE, one thing that should become very uh, obvious is that the amount of mentions on Facebook are far overriding the mentions on all other social channels. Now, what this says to me is that all of these appliance companies 
are really buttering their bread on Facebook and they're minimizing the importance of other social channels like Twitter, YouTube, uh, Instagram, forums, blogs. Now, this is your opportunity as Whirlpool to basically grab these uh, channels that have not been staked out yet and start spreading your messaging on channels that are not already full of appliance messaging. So just taking a quick look at this, it gives you the opportunity to uh, investigate these other channels. Maybe Instagram doesn't work for you, but one thing that's really important for manufacturers are forums and blogs as you get the most passionate people talking about your products and details there. So identifying those potential channels for future activation and investment is a huge thing that you can learn from what the competition is doing. Next, we'll very quickly get into market intelligence. So this is uh, marketing intelligence for home goods, uh, a store here in the United States that sells uh, furniture, bedding, artwork, uh, basically anything that you might use to decorate your home. So when we're talking about home goods, what we want to know as a, uh, a marketer within an agency is how do we monitor these influencers who are advocating for our client brands? And this gets deeper into what products are driving conversation. What can we learn from influencer affinities? How do we spot emerging voices and where do we invest in the future? Now, the reason why I picked home goods is because it's a very dynamic brand from a retail perspective. Uh, Every day you go into Home Goods, you're going to find different items. So they're uh, selling primarily remainders or things that were overstocked in other stores. Their inventory is constantly changing and you can never predict what you're going to find there, which really plays into that whole idea of social messaging from the point of purchase. So when you look at what products are driving conversation, one of the things when you're like trying to segment your audience that I thought was really interesting here is if you drill into each one of these word clouds for specific audiences, you really begin to get down to what is it that's resonating in these places or amongst these groups. So I looked at just home goods stores in California, and the thing that really just rose to the top was this brand, Christopher Street, which sells organic products. People were posting pictures of their jams, their pickles, their salad dressings, and it was a obvious trend in California. Now, when I drill down into what is it about uh, males that is appealing, uh, that makes home goods appealing, it is a totally different story. You're be able to get down into the market of what is it that uh, men are talking about when they talk about home goods. They're talking about natural wood tones and the uh, more masculine uh, items of decoration that they might sell in home goods. So it's not, despite the fact that your audience might be primarily uh, female, males still represent an incredible portion of the revenue that's driving through the stores, so you can't ignore them in your advertising or messaging. Last but not least, if, if I just looked at the YouTube audience, you could begin to see that it's not just um, people who are buying new sneakers or new cosmetics who like to unwrap and reveal things on YouTube. People who go to Home Goods, to Marshalls, to TJ Maxx, they love to get onto YouTube and start talking about their scores. You know, what did they haul in for the day? Because they never know what they're going to get. It's exciting for them to share with their friends. And it's exciting for friends to look at what's available at Home Goods, which could potentially drive further traffic into the store. What do we learn from the affinities of these influencers? Well, a whole bunch of different things. So if you look at uh, the box on the left, we're looking at just the affinities for a small portion of the Home Goods audience. And one of the things that you might be able to pull out of these affinities is that, you know, obviously people like fashion and beauty. If they, they have an affinity for home goods to begin with, then those are things that they're going to like art and culture, photography, food and drink. These things kind of go hand in hand with home goods. The few things here that I thought were interesting, you could see pets. So I checked off pets because it gives you an opportunity here as a, a agency that's representing home goods to learn from these influencer affinities. An awful lot of people who are posting about home goods, it turns out, are posting pictures of their dogs and cats alongside the products that they just bought from home goods. You can also even see in the interests cloud on the right, if you look very closely, you could pick out the words cat and dog. So somehow pets and home goods go together, and this might be something that you not have realized as a result of 
just looking at your day-to-day -day owned mentions. So looking at these proactive earned mentions is going to give you some intelligence that you might be able to use in the future, sell more pet products in the store or include pets in advertisements. How do we spot emerging voices? Well, we typically do that in a, several different ways here, but the easiest way for our clients is to use our influencer widget, which will surface uh, the most influential users across social networks uh, based on the topics that they're talking about. So in this case, uh, Deirdre Renee rose to the top. Uh, and when you start to look at the posts that she's putting out there, she is posting uh, not frequently, but once a, once a month around about home goods. She has a large audience of followers, yet she is not a part of home goods uh, digital activation team that you can find on Pinterest, which is basically a group of designers, uh, interior decorators that home goods activates to post pins on their Pinterest board. So obviously, uh, influencers are going to rise to the surface based on the amount of interactions they're getting on their post, how much they're uh, talking about your brand, what networks they're talking about your brand on, what types of posts they're putting out there. Now, the interesting thing is, is that uh, influencers don't just come down to uh, females talking about design. There are tons of male influencers who are uh, in the home goods community as well. And you can see, as I mentioned before, it really is an entirely different look and feel for the male influencers. They're using natural tones. There's an awful lot of leather and wood in the posts that they're putting out. So it's for a completely different audience. So now you're being able to get this idea of, I have influencers, but I can't group them all together. They have to be grouped into kind of buckets based on the audience that they're influencing. So where do we invest in the future? Well, you can see here that our audience is very heavily invested in Instagram uh, and uh, second most on Twitter. Now, where I see an opportunity for an advancement here is on YouTube. As I mentioned before, YouTube may not be the most engaging channel when it comes to generating uh, useful comments, but what it does is it gets your brand out there and it gets people talking about the products that you sell. You can see sentiment on YouTube is rather high, yet their volume is rather low. So where do we invest in the future? For me, it's all about YouTube here. So we talked about sales, we talked about accounts, and we talked about marketing activation and how they can each use social intelligence individually. But what I put together here is this organization-based uh, social intelligence model, which is social intelligence uh, used to inform all programs across the agency. So when you look at this, at the middle of that graphic on the left, social intelligence sits in the middle. You have a stakeholder who's feeding information to each one of these six teams. Now, how does this look as part of a big picture? Uh, you know, you can obviously look at this from a Snickers perspective, which is an individual brand. How do we pitch uh, Snickers executives to win the account? How do we maintain that account? How do we avert crisis? How do we activate our audiences and so on? But sometimes things are bigger than an individual brand when you're working at an agency. So if you're dealing with a huge enterprise brand like Hilton, which owns uh, you know over 10 different types of properties around the world, you're going to need to start to think about social intelligence from a much wider angle. So obviously here, uh, all for one, one for all, when we're talking about Hilton, we have all these brands we need to monitor, but let's tell a story here as we walk through uh, this graph. So let's say you're trying to win Hilton as a brand. You go in to your pitch with your share of voice right off the bat. You want to show Hilton where each one of their brands ranks within a matrix of uh, share of voice. And you could see if you look really closely here that Waldorf, Waldorf Astoria is owning share of voice followed by what you would expect, uh, Embassy Suites, Hilton Hotels and Resorts, Doubletree. These are the most common names across the industry. So obviously we have that information. We win the account, let's say, from Hilton based on the strength of our pitch. We've shown them an awful lot of information that is gonna be valuable to them. And now we have them as an account and we wanna start tracking their social reputation score. So we're going to monitor their brand health by benchmarking against competitors as well as past campaign performance, as well as umbrella brands. So we'll be able to see exactly how each one of these brands is uh, generating conversations online, as well as how people feel about them, as well as how far 
their reach might be for their uh, organic messaging. We're gonna then pass the ball to PR, which can be monitoring these dashboards at all times for social media crisis. Now, what this allows them to do is to be able to get a gauge on what crisis triggers might be, who potential detractors might be that would start a crisis so that they can start to plan a proactive strategy ahead of time. Part of this proactive strategy is going to be uh, setting alerts within their dashboard. So we're, we enable clients to set alerts based on uh, crossing of volume thresholds or sentiment thresholds. So if the uh, amount of negative sentiment goes up over the course of a week, we'll get an alert sent out, which will activate the PR team to start their crisis response strategy. Now we're gonna pass the ball to marketing activation. And as I mentioned before, uh, influencers are an, uh, an increasingly important part of any marketing activation program. And social intelligence really empowers that influencer program in several different ways. So first, you're able to segment that audience, not just into influencers who might be famous people or they might have 150,000 followers on Twitter or 3 million followers on Twitter. You wanna be able to differentiate those influencers from advocates and consumer voices and detractors. Now, advocates might be those long tail of influencers. They might only have uh, you know, 5,000 followers, but they're incredibly influential in that audience. So you can segment that out and start to activate those people, send them specific messaging. And then even down to the consumer voice, these might not be people who are activating people or influencing people, but they're still important to your brand when it comes to what they have to say about your products, what they have to say about staying in your rooms at the Hilton. So even if it's a one-time poster who's complaining about a dirty room, you still need to be able to segment these audiences into maybe detractors or complainers so that you can monitor them for the future. We're gonna then pass this data that we've gleaned for brand health, for sales, for share of voice, for sentiment over to our analytics team uh, through an API, which is able to push all of our social data from Synthesio out into any business intelligence tool that you might wanna use. Uh, a lot of our clients use uh, Domo to basically suck in the information from uh, the Synthesio platform and then begin to cross cut that social data, data against other data from digital channels. So you might be able to tie uh, an increase in negative sentiment to a decrease in sales in the long term. So again, really important if you're managing a brand across all disciplines here. Last but not least, we have product. So you wanna make sure you test with the right audience and launch with the right messaging. So let's say Hilton wants to uh, launch a new boutique hotel brand that is super modern, that they want to compete with uh, W Hotels. Uh, well, obviously going out into the market and testing, finding out what people have to say about W Hotels, what they have to say about existing Hilton Hotels is really gonna give you that market intelligence that you need in order to launch a new brand or new product into the marketplace. Okay, so now we've come to the portion of our broadcast where we have a special guest speaker. David Parkinson, uh, co-founder of Brave and Heart, is going to walk us through some best practices for global agencies uh, to give you a counterpoint to the US agency focus that I just walked through. So uh, David, take it away. Hey, Greg. Uh, thanks for inviting me along to the uh, webinar. It's been great fun so far. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I as, as Greg said, everybody, I am um, currently co-founder of a, uh, a digital marketing consultancy called Brave and Heart. Uh, previously, I was the head of social media for Nissan in Europe, uh, and I was also the head of digital for Nissan in Africa, Middle East, and India. And within that time of those two jobs, which is about five or six years, doesn't time fly, um, I worked very closely with Synthesio through several global pitches in, you know, helping integrate the tool into the business. So got quite a bit of experience in, you know, the best ways of doing that and the best ways of, you know, utilizing a, uh, you know, an online listening tool to really help provide value to the business, both a business as a brand, but, you know, in this case as well, trying to make sure that our agencies were using Synthesio in the right way. So I've got a, you know, I've got a couple of slides here just to take you all through as we go through the webinar, just to, you know, to, to go through some of the best practices that I feel that agencies can 
put in place as they're you know looking to try and utilize social listening to support their brands and i think i'll always start with kpis and measurement as we can see on on the on the next slide you know you you know it's an old saying and i can't remember who said it somebody much cleverer than i am but you know you can't you can't manage what you're not measuring and although it, you can go too far down that rabbit hole and, and start to measure too much in so much as you start to use the measurement to drive the the business in the wrong way and the you know the business becomes the measurement rather than what you're actually trying to achieve you really have to put kpis and measurement in place for social listening i, I know a lot of agencies and brands that buy a social listening tool and then they just start to use it without having any real focus. And we always thought that the, the best way to get that focus was around KPIs and measuring. And, you know, you really have to align that measurement of what you're going to, to track yourself against, against your business strategies. You know, if you're trying to improve your reputation, if you're trying to get better customer satisfaction, then make sure you utilize the online listening tool or Synthesio to help drive that. And so, you know, when you're building those kpis really focus on building primary kpis i found in my experience that it was very easy to accidentally take a um you know uh, just a performance indicator and think it was a key performance indicator you know when i'm thinking about performance indicators it's it's the sort of things like you know facebook likes and facebook shares and you know the, the sort of lower value add that people will measure themselves against because they can get big numbers very quickly that sound very impressive but actually they're not helping the overall the overall business and really two of the key kpis that i really focused on a lot in my time in nissan and what we're now advising some of our clients to do is really focus on share of voice and the reputation that goes along with that share of voice and i've, I've said this from the start of social listening from many many years ago when we started doing it there's no point in creating share of voice for your brand without making sure that share of voice is positive. Anybody can create more noise. The point is, can you make more noise that has positive impact on your audience? So I always took two KPIs and used them together. And one was share of voice versus key brands out there in the market versus whatever your brand is. Uh, in the case of Nissan, it was various other car brands, but you know, if you're managing an FMCG or you know any sort of packaged goods or you know any type of brand like that, you need to find the, the four or five key competitors and your brand will know who they are and uh, make sure you, you get that measurement right and uh, measure against the right people. So, you know, don't forget to look at those KPIs in the right way and set them correctly. But, you know, look at competitor benchmarking. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the focus on this webinar so far has been, well, how can you guys use the tool to support your brands? And what are the sort of things that you can put in place for your brands? And, you know, in, in, again, in my time at agencies, agencies were not very good at coming forwards with positive backed up information using real data from from out there in the wild and i think you know when you're starting to look at competitive benchmarking and you know share of voice measurement and sentiment come go to your brand and say well we've done the competitive benchmarking and here's the proof of it a lot of a lot of it seems to be on we've had a good idea or there was a gut feel or you know this is the direction we should go to but brands are really looking to have some positive reason to make that investment in whatever it is you're trying to do uh, be that a campaign uh, be it a, a TV ad, be it a, a new product in the market, they need some proof points. And going to them with the proof points backed up by data that you've used for analyzing the market will always really help your case um, sell that to the brand. And you know, measure on a on a you know as your client needs. So that could be monthly, it could be ad hoc, it could be on a project by project basis. I think one of the key things again that I, I was always missing from uh, from from the agency that supported me was if you do a campaign for a brand, measure it and proof point what you did. You know, what was the starting position? What was the ending position? And what did you manage to change as a, as a reason for what you've just done? And, and it can be tricky because, you know, some people don't want to be held accountable for what they've just done. They want to just say, hey, we had a great campaign and look how successful it was. And we had loads of retweets. And, you know, the, the bigger question is, well, not how many retweets do we have, but how many people were actually talking about it and what were they saying? Was it positive or negative? And providing those proof points which could be negative in the case of your campaign, that's fine. Use that to make the next campaign better. And I think that's that's what a brand's actually looking for, a good brand anyway. They're looking for proof points that may not back up what they've just done, but allows you to get better and to continuously improve. Um, and, and as I say in that final point, really, really add value to the process. Um, a brand will very quickly feel that you're trying to upsell to them something that's not actually adding some value. 
double joy, Greg, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I think that one of the interesting things uh, that I was thinking about as you were going through KPIs and measurement was, uh, you know, in relation to share of voice and making sure that you're measuring the sentiment or how people feel around that share of voice. The perfect example is what's been going on with airlines over the last few weeks. I mean, they're generating a ton, a ton of noise out there and volume of mentions uh, and interactions, but most of it is negative. So when you're benchmarking uh, yourself as an airline, it might make sense to benchmark and then see who is doing the best of the worst. Yeah, and, and airlines is a great example because I, I um, have been following the United uh, debacle with interest. And I think, you know, whereas there was a very initial, um, you know, very initial large drop in their share value, it was around 200, 250 million, I believe. Yeah. Um, it actually it actually came back up fairly quickly. So there was a blip. Um, but, you know, that's the sort of example where, as, as United, I'd be looking to say, well, can we overlay the share of voice and sentiment against that blip? And is there a point where the negativity actually affects our share price positively or negatively? And, you know, and then you can start to make business decisions on the top of that um, and start to say, well, OK, what is the, you know, and we, we use this very successfully, actually, Greg. We, we did a campaign quite a few years ago now where we had a we had a crisis. We talk about crisis again in the moment. But, you know, we, we had a crisis with um, one of our electric vehicles due to a, a UK TV program. And what we did was we we knew it was going to happen. We'd been pre-warned. We measured the the share of voice and the sentiment after the TV program. But most importantly, we we took a snapshot of what those conversations were, and then we built proof points around those conversations to counteract the arguments that were happening online. And we used targeted press releases. Uh, and this is where you really need you know comms to work more effectively alongside a marketing function, as an example. But we you know we then released press releases. Um, there's little uh, videos, little how-tos, uh, which the community quickly picked up and, and started to use to counteract that negative share of voice. So what looked like a crisis on the Sunday was quickly turned around to a very positive situation by the Friday because of the way that we we deployed and, uh, and implemented the social listening. Uh, and more importantly, looked at that share of voice, looked at that reputation, looked at the conversations that were happening inside that share of voice, and then use those conversations as proof points to move forwards and say, well, OK, what do we build our future discussions around, uh, which is what we did. And we were able to show that, you know, yes, we had a negative share of voice, but actually we created a lot more conversations that would never have happened in the first place. And they became much more positive by uh, the end of the week. And I think, um, you know, if you're not measuring back to the point about measure, 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 uh, if you're not measuring, how, how would you even know any of that? And I think that's a key you know, a key reason to to utilize Synthesio and an online listening tool is to to start tracking and measuring. And it could be on a, as I said, it could be a, a daily or a regular basis, but it could be ad hoc when you know something's coming along. And, you know, but if I was united, you, it's hard to know that's going to happen because obviously the way Twitter hit, it was very, very real time. But within a couple of hours, they could have had a dashboard running. I'm, I'm sure they may have done, um, but a dashboard running that started to amalgamate the conversations, work out what the proof points were. And, you know, the the actual press release they put out could have probably been crafted a lot better bearing in mind the conversations people were having I, I love those examples particularly the proactive crisis response because i think it leads us really well into your next slide which is what happens when you can't predict the crisis uh and i believe you're going to talk a little bit about uh the latest crisis that pepsi went through with their kendall jenner commercial yeah i mean again a, a very interesting scenario but i mean what I'm, what I'm really trying to get across to the to the audience on this webinar and in this slide is, you know, real time marketing is, has been a buzzword for a couple of years now. And, um, you know, I, I've we've done it. And some of our clients at the moment for Brave and Heart, um, you know, are asking us about setting these up and what should they do to them. And the reality is I'm not a, it's not that I'm not a fan, but if you're going to use real time marketing, it has to be done properly. And it can't just be a you know a couple of screens to improve the you know to um, impress the executives, which is what generally happens. I think a lot of brands say they're doing real-time marketing, and what they have is a couple of screens in the corner. Maybe they have a couple of screens and a guy sat watching them, but they what they don't do is they don't build a process around what it is they're trying to do. And as I say, my second point point, you need a purpose and an objective. If you're going to do real-time marketing, do it for a reason. 
And, you know, it may be you are the New York Times and you're going to do real time marketing based upon the breaking news that's happening on a real time basis. That's great. But if you're a brand, you know, um, sitting there waiting for a real time event to happen and, you know, when we've ran real time marketing and I hate the word war room, people use the word war room because it, it almost gives it a negative or, a, um, you know, an aggressive connotation. But, you know, we, you, we've we set up real time marketing at key events. And for us, you know, when I was at Nissan, that was things like football matches and sponsorships that we were running and nothing happened. You know, and the worst thing that can happen really is then you start doing what, what's known as branter and having conversations with other brands in an echo bubble of what's going on. And so if you're going to set up real time marketing, have a process, have a purpose and have an objective. Otherwise, it's just a waste of time and money. And, you know, and if you're not careful, it can result in an uncontrollable crisis situation. There, there's some good examples of that. Um, this is a very European. Uh, sorry for the uh, the US audience, but I'm sure any European uh, guys listening will will understand this. But we had the the Eurovision Song Contest at the weekend, uh, just gone, uh, and I think it was Portugal that won. So we had the Eurovision Song Contest, and uh, that would have been a really great example of um, you know what is people talking about. And there were a lot of brands in that space trying to create conversation around the the real-time marketing that was happening at the time there were uh, an, an innocent smoothies or the innocent brand was one that was doing this on twitter they were basically watching the eurovision and tweeting out in real time of what they were seeing now at one point they made a comment about ireland uh because ireland weren't singing and they they sort of forgotten that ireland were actually judging even though they weren't singing and they made a comment which was ireland you're dead to us <laughs> and um very very quickly the audience turned against them and was like, whoa, hold on, you know, we've had a bit of fun with your branter here. We've had, you know, we've had some, you know, some fun coming on with you guys, but you know, you've overstepped the mark here. Now they managed to pull it back very quickly, but you know, again, this is the, the situation where you need a, you know, a real good time, you know, real good real time monitoring scenario that's running, so you can pick up these conversations and quickly understand when when you're going too far, when you're overstepping the boundary. Some of it's just having good staff and processors who understand how to talk to people. But some of it is technical and about saying, well, who, what are the conversations? What are people saying? You know, how can we hook into this? And, and if you do get yourself into a into a problem, how do we, you know, how do we go around this? Now, Pepsi is a really good example. Now, uh, you know, I'm not going to go and on and on about the Pepsi scenario because, uh, you know, this every man and his dog on LinkedIn's done that for me. <laughs> but you can you can sort of look at how Synthesio could have really helped them in a number of ways for um, before, during, and after the, the advert. I'll call it the advert. And um, you know, the first one was, if they'd done a bit of better upfront analysis of what people were talking around and their feeling around, you know, sort of getting into that space of, um, you know, protest or the positive protest, they would have probably quickly realized that this wasn't the best place to do an advert. And I think that that could have been, you know, let's do some um, some listening. Let's have a look at what all the conversations are around this area and see where the two match. And I think they would have very quickly seen this is not the best advert that we can do. I think the other thing they could have done using listening online is, you know, obviously the um, was it Kendall? I'm not a, I'm not really into the Kendall Jenner. Yeah, I believe this one is Kendall. Kendall Jenner. So, so I'm not a I'm not a Kardashians fan, but um, you know the other thing they could have done is look at the audience for Kendall Jenner and work out what could have been the best conversation to have around that. And I think that's where you can use some of the great tools that Synthesia provides, looking at overlapping segments of of information and um, you know interest topics and say, well, actually, and and I find in these scenarios, white space is a good place to look. Um, which is don't look at the obvious because you get the obvious things with Kendall Jenner is going to be hair and makeup and clothing. But, you know, look at some of the white space around some of the conversations she may be having and some of the things that people are interested in around that celebrity. And then, you know, maybe we can create a space in here. And I think, it, you know, one thing where there wouldn't have been white space is Kendall Jenner and protest marching. Um, but there, there could have been something else if they'd done the upfront analysis. And then again, when the crisis hit and the conversations happened, it actually took them quite some time to both pull it um, and then also to um, to put out a response to it. And I do know, because I have some friends that um, work in Pepsi in the UK, you know, the, the briefing that, that could have gone out and the tools are available them, to them could have been a lot better 
to help handle that situation. And I think, again, how do you use your listening software to do that? How do you, um, you know, okay, we've got a crisis now. And this is where the good age old PR crisis management happens. And I, I did a presentation the other week and I think they used to call it the golden hour in a PR crisis. Um, and now it's the golden minute um, because of the speed of social media. Now, I don't think it's actually a minute, but you do need to put out a holding statement very quickly, which is what you need your PR expertise to do. But then you need to huddle around Start getting the data in, start looking at the analysis, pulling in your um, Synthesio reports, pulling in the conversations and say, OK, this is what's happened. This is what people are saying. What should our response be? And that, you know, and I've said there, you know, as an agency, you need to get your brand ready for that. If you're a PR agency using listen software or even if you're a marketing agency, sometimes it's a case of, hey, you know, here's our great advert. We're going to put it out. But no one ever says, but what if it's not taken so well? What could be the situation? And some of that's just good old fashioned crisis project management. You know, you're looking at uh, what could happen positively and negative to any anything you put out there. Um, so, you know, real time marketing and crisis management. I'm really hot on crisis management. I've managed a few crises in my time um, and they are not fun when you're in the eye of the storm. But the key is to, to you know, keep your head about you when all around you may be losing theirs. Um, but use the tools at your disposal. And Synthesio was, a, was an invaluable tool when I was in a crisis situation to, to really get a proper handle on what was happening. And sometimes I think it's really key with crisis. Is it, is it actually a crisis? Is it really a crisis? Um, you know, what is an issue that you can just quickly manage yourself? And what is a real proper crisis? Um, a lot of people can escalate an issue to a crisis inadvertently because of the, the social fluff that happens around that. When actually it's just a flash in a pan, it's a, you know, a small conversation that would die out very quickly anyway. Uh, and you really need the proper tools and processes and, and, and people in place to manage that. So that's that's sort of my point on real time management and crisis and some tips there. You know, uh, what I was thinking about while while you were uh, speaking about real time management and crisis really goes back to what I was preaching about at the beginning of the broadcast, which is. Many times agencies are rolling out social intelligence in silos. And in the case of Pepsi here, even if they were using social intelligence, it seems like the creative team was living in their own little bubble without even trying to proactively figure out what type of audience expectations might not be met with this ad uh, and without even doing any preliminary research to see, like you said, if protesters and uh Kendall Jenner actually go together in the same sentence. So I think that there was a lot of uh, audience intelligence that they were missing out here, which could have potentially set them up for uh, crisis management if they had known ahead of time that they might be pressing the wrong buttons. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you know, and there's lots of whys and wherefores because this was also an in-house agency rather than uh, an external house. So, yeah. you know, you, you can find that they are less open to um, to having their own Kool-Aid taken away from them. Yes. Uh, and I think, you know, sometimes you need to have an, a, an independent objective view of, sorry guys, the Kool-Aid doesn't taste so good, let's let's do something different. Yeah, and it's funny that that objective view can sometimes be 10,000 people's subjective view coming through social media. Correct, correct. Yeah, totally, totally right. So we'll move on to your uh, your next slide here. Cool. So, I mean, and just if, just you know, before we have a quick Q and A at the end, just some really final tips for you guys out there in the webinar um, about you know how I, you know, the tips I can give you as a, as an agency that's going to be either supporting your brand or pitching to a brand or you know using consultancies such as Brave and Heart to to really help you get to the nub of what your brand needs to understand and put in place. And I think the first one is, um, and actually just to pick up on a point that you said there, Greg, which I think is, is interesting, it's something to remember as you're pitching and talking to your brands is is this silo conversation and it, as much as we we don't like it and we all know it's a bad idea everybody's a silo uh, agencies are silo and brands are silos and and you know as an agency you need to try and remove the silos internally because you're more flexible to do that um, in in some aspects and you need to help your your brand break through those silos as well. So you know, if you're a marketing agency, that's all well and good, but don't forget that there is a, um, a communications and a PR team and a customer service team and an R and D team inside that brand that you know on one side could be part of a of a sort of a cross sell or an upsell to what you're trying to provide, but on the other side, 
as much as you can help remove the pain for your brand as possible, then, then they're going to appreciate you in the longer term from that and see you as a value add uh, rather than just a cost. So, uh, and then aligned with that, I think one of the key things is, you know, don't try and sell what the brand doesn't need. Um, I, I, you know, pre synthesio days, I, I constantly had some agencies trying to sell me white labeled online software um, or white labeled something. And the reality is I, I didn't need them and I didn't want them. And, you know, that's, that can sour the relationship very quickly if you don't, if you don't understand that and realize that you need to, to really try and sell what the brand needs. What is, how can you remove the problems from, from the person you're trying to support in the brand? How can you help them do their job better? And they will quickly recognize that versus someone trying to sell them something they don't need. And, I, you know, I use the double glazing scenario. Um, if I want double glazing, I'll go and buy it. Um, the last thing I want to be, you know, sold as double glazing when I go shopping. And I think, you know, tr don't try and sell double glazing to your brand. Do, you, do they have double glazing in the U.S., Greg? I'm sure I, are you no, so? no. No, never heard of it? Okay. No. Double glazing is a European thing where we have two panes of glass to keep out the noise because our roads are much closer to our houses than they are over there in America. Oh, I'm so, well, you know, we could use that here in the office. I'm surprised you haven't heard the traffic coming through yet. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, just, to, you know, and as I said earlier, focus on the, on the measurements and tangible KPIs. I, I said it again. I'll bang on and on and on about it. You know, measure, measure, measure. Um, make sure you're measuring the right things. Make sure you're not measuring the things for the sake of it. Make sure you're not measuring performance indicators instead of key performance indicators. Of course, you should measure your performance indicators. That's not what I'm saying, but don't mistake the two and get them the wrong way around. Um, and that's, that's, you know, make sure they're linked back to the brand's objectives. I, I, um, I'm, I'm constantly surprised by the number of clients that, that even I have as Brave and Heart now. Um, where they, they're, they're not measuring something which is aligned to the objectives and meeting that measurement becomes the objective in itself rather, and, and lots of you know, tools and tricks that people do to meet that measurement, especially once that measurement is tied into some sort of compensation. So, you know, really focus on getting those KPIs set right. You know, and, and again, as I said, how, do you, how can you provide value? How can you help them? Do some do some analysis of the brand. You know, sit down in a, a you know brainstorm or mind melding, whatever it's called nowadays, mind mapping. Sit yourselves down in a room and say, well, okay, here's my brand. Here's what their problems are. I know what their problems are. I should know them very well. Okay, what's the best way of doing this? What's the best way of managing their problems? And how can we help them? And how can online listening and Synthesio support them in that mission? What can I provide them? Could it be research and development could be you know we're having a big problem with customer service at the moment could it be um you know we need to properly measure their campaigns for them because they're doing lots of tv advertising and those campaigns aren't leading to more sales so you know is there some way we can make those better try and think around how you can use data positively um, to help improve their life and make things easier for them and um as i said earlier uh, you know sort of linked to the silo part you know you have to remember the reality of brand life and an enterprise and provide the appropriate support. Um, one of the key things that I found working in a brand um, is, is life is a, is, a, is a round table of phone calls and meetings. There's not actually much time to get any work done because you're so busy talking about the work that you need to get done. And that's why a lot of brands have agencies and that's why they're using them to provide the ability to get the work done that they're coordinating through this whole series of meetings and phone calls they've got so understand that you know when you're pitching to the brand when you're talking to the brand you're you're trying to make their life easier uh, and it's certainly one of the things that we you know that we're doing as brave and heart is going into the, the clients we've got and saying you know we're here to make your life easier and we're here to use the, the, the partners that we can find you know the, the best partners in the in the market to make your life easy to provide that value add for you and then the final one because you know it was a bugbear for me when I was in a brand, and certainly for the for the few campaigns that we've already delivered as Brave and Heart, um, I always make sure that we do it. In fact, we've, we've just finished a, a great um, activity in Dubai recently, and we've used our um, our Synthesio software to, to measure the results of that afterwards and prove the value of what it is that we did. But measure your campaigns. Now, and be honest with yourselves. Did it work well? Did it not work so well? What could have gone better? You know, build into a proper, you know, a PDCA process where you do a, a check at the end and say, well, what worked well and what didn't work so well? And how is the data backing this up? OK, and what actions do we put in place for next time to make sure that it works better? So measure, 
show the value, and then if it, the value is not as good as you thought it would be, work out how you'd make it better next time. Awesome. So uh, thank you, David. We've come to the uh, part of the broadcast where we'll uh, field some of your questions. We got an awful lot of questions in the uh, comment field here. I'll just uh, cherry pick a couple. Um, this one's for uh, David. How would you recommend setting up a social team within a small boutique agency to ensure maximum output and success? That question comes from uh, Sam P. Well, I mean, that's a really interesting one because I think, um, you know, again, this was very similar inside the brand, which is, you know, you take when you take a tool such as Synthesio, and actually Synthesio is one of the easiest ones out there in the market. There's some, some much more complicated ones out there um, for, for managing and setting up social listening. But e even one that's as simple as Synthesio, you know, it's sometimes hard to find people inside the brand who, who you can train and are not moving around so quickly that they can use the software. And so, you know, one of the things I always did within my teams and also the agency that worked for me was always always make sure that there was somebody in that team that was able to utilize the software and do it properly. So, you know, if, if you're looking at a social team inside a small boutique agency, you know, you, you're not people rich. You know, there may be five, 10, 15 of you, um, but you're also doing lots of other things at the same time. So your ability to have a dedicated social listening person um which may be possible and if you can do it i would i would certainly recommend you do do that but the capability is usually not not there but what you do need to do is find somebody in the organization who is analytically minded who is able to use online software and understand some you know some basic um, structured query language and how to create reports as, as simple as synthesio is sometimes it can be a lot easier to get into the nuts and bolts of the tool and write the reports by hand um, and write the queries by hand and just double check them by hand. But the find someone in your organization that can do that and give them a partial responsibility to be your your person that's doing that. Um, and it could be one person, it could be two people, um, but, but give them the training, give them the tool, give them the software. And you know, every time I've done that, the, the people have really enjoyed it. They've really enjoyed uh, being able to understand that. And it's enriched their ability in business completely because it's a side of um, you know the conversations that you wouldn't get to see normally. A lot of people are sort of um, a customer blind. They talk about customers a lot, but they don't really listen to what they have to say. So when you make it someone's job to listen to customers, they suddenly get a different realization of, of what's happening out there. So I would always you know, try and create a small center of excellence inside your, or your agency who have that, who can, you know, can have that expertise to do the listening and build a small team that can then do the work for you. Now, at such a point where you can expand or give it to the job of one person, say, okay, you're now our analyst, then, you know, as you're using it properly and using it for R&D and customer service and crisis management and measuring campaigns and, you know, doing investigation for campaigns for what, you know, what will work well in what marketplace, et cetera, then maybe you can justify having one or two people full time. But, you know, work up to that, you know, work, you know, give it a responsibility. And then once your brand buys into that, I think you've got a much better chance of then taking on people that have a, um, a much wider responsibility. Question here from uh, Cody H, which I'm going to alter a little bit based on your response to the last question. Uh, Cody wanted to know what would you consider to be the most important social intelligence use cases for agencies? But I'd like to twist that question a little bit and get your opinion on how do you think uh, agencies should uh, first enter into their social intelligence programs? Is there a use case that you think uh, provides kind of the easiest barrier to entry? Well, I mean, I, I think the use case is, um, you know, a lot, a lot of agencies will be pitching ideas to brands and it could be an existing brand or a new brand. And, and somebody comes up with a great idea and says, I'm going to pitch this to the brand. And I think the, the best, use case to go into as an agency the first time you start to use social listening is to do the competitive analysis and the background analysis of that idea that proves why it's a good idea um, i think that's the best place to start i mean there's lots of other places you can go and you know we talked to it with the, with the pepsi example where um, you could do some upfront listening uh, you could do some listening during the campaign and do you know crisis management afterwards but i think the easiest start point for me is is to 
is the start point which helps you sell more things and effectively you know you're you you know you are an agency that's trying to create business and you're trying to convince the your brand that the idea you've had is the is the best idea that they've you know they've ever seen and having the proof points behind that is probably the best entry point and i think the proof points behind that is using the online listening to say this is the campaign we've got and this is the direction we want to go to and we've looked at the audience and we've looked at what it is they're talking about and this idea is exactly the right link to to the audience that we're trying to reach and again you know this is good old-fashioned marketing which is who is your audience what is the segmentation um, what type of person are they what age bracket are they what appeals to them and doing that backward information which you can do with synthesio which is to start putting out reports to say well okay let's look at this class of people let's look at these conversations around these topics okay let's break it down even further what are the subtopics inside there and start to use that to drive your campaign once you take that to a, to a, um, your customer, in this case a brand, and say, okay, here's the idea I've had, and here's why I've had it, and here's the proof that this will work well, then you'll find the sale will go much easier than, here's a great idea. And the brand will go, well, why have you come up with idea, that idea? And once you've got the points ready, I think um, it will really help ease into that. And then you can start to expand out the other areas of where you could be using uh, Synthesio and an online listening software, such as you know helping them with the crisis management, doing your back end reporting after the um, you know after the campaign's finished, you know building it into your PDCA cycle, etc. Awesome. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, this one's actually for me, but I think that we can kind of tag team this one. Uh, so people were interested in uh, what are some of the trends that you were able to uncover. Uh, during your analysis of the data for this presentation that uh, might help land customers? Well, you know, uh, one of the things that everybody knows at this point is that people love to post either pictures of the food they're eating or uh, complaints of uh, product mishaps or uh, bad experiences that they've had at hotels. That is not going to be very insightful information. I think that one of the most interesting things that I found uh, when building dashboards for this report actually came out of something that we didn't have time to include. So uh, I built a dashboard for Burger King uh, and the focus of the dashboard, the use case was a product innovation or product launch. And what I did was tracked um, customer conversation around Burger King's new product slash sandwich slash snack food launches over the past year. And one of the things that I found that was tremendously interesting is that despite the fact that Burger King keeps getting weirder and weirder with their product launches, whether they're Cheeto fries or hot dogs or chicken finger fries, it seems to be the type of thing that their audience is not embracing. And they continue to roll out these weird products despite the really huge amount of volume that would account for backlash against these products as the world is really trying to get healthier. It seems like a lot of our fast food chains are going in the opposite direction. So what people are looking for from these types of restaurants is not necessarily, you know, a Dorito mixed with a Cheeto mixed with a hamburger, but instead they're looking for something healthy, a healthy alternative, uh, particularly adults who are taking their kids to these fast food restaurants are looking for a healthy alternative for themselves, uh, even if their kids are still eating Happy Meals. So I think that that was one of the really interesting things. Uh, what I would call kind of like audience blindness amongst uh, a brand that's trying to release new products, but not paying attention to what their customers are saying about old products. So uh, Dave, interested to hear your thoughts on that in terms of conversational trends that you might have picked up in your analysis over the last few weeks. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's a really great point. And I, I think the example that also pops to mind around that one was I think McDonald's a month ago, six weeks ago, um, released some sort of chip device. Um, it was something where you could eat individual chips with this chip fork or something yeah, like this. Yeah, yeah. So you could put three chips into a special fork and eat them on a fork. Now, I think the reality of some of these products is, you know, as as the world, as and this gets down to you know what I call the sea of noise, <laughs> um, or another word I use for it, social confetti. 
And um, you know, out there in the in the noise world, be it in the Twitter sphere or anywhere else, there is there is a lot of noise. You know, um, there's a lot of dross coming out from brands that it's just you know sort of middle of the road type content. And I, and I think what's happening in these cases, and, and the McDonald's case is one. And I think even some of the Burger King stuff. Now, and I've seen other brands, you know, announce weird things. What they're trying to do is try, and this is almost PR stunts. They're trying to create something that will cut through the the usual blah noise that's going out there, and and that's great. You know, PR stunts have their place, and, and a lot of marketing departments are now using those old PR stunt techniques. And be that a chip fork or a you know a um, you know a, a weird fish burger tasting uh, product, <laughs> but. But as you say, you know, the problem with that, you know, activity such as that, and I, I, you know, again, I call this the lizard's tail of noise, is what happens is it creates a spike which very quickly dissipates and provides no value to that brand over the long term at all. And, and this gets back to the very first point I made, in fact, which is share of voice versus reputation. And it's not just about creating noise, it's about creating positive noise. And if you're just creating noise around a new weird tasting burger that's not positive, you're actually doing your brand a long term disservice. And, and in those cases, they're probably just measuring the share of voice rather than the, the sentiment that goes around that share of voice and how positive it is. As soon as you get your your agency, your brand, your campaign focused on we need to create more noise and it needs to be positive and it should be around these areas. And these are proof points that we've already backed up by X, Y, and Z. Then all of a sudden you'll find much more longer term success than weird product A or weird product B. So I think there's a lot of sort of elements in there, Greg, around you know good old fashioned game, good old fashioned marketing, which is you know what is your audience segmentation? What are they looking at? What are the conversations around that? Um, is this product working? Yes or no? Some of those products should be pulled. You know, put it out there, um, see what the audience participation is. Uh, have some fun with it. If it doesn't work, pull it and try again. And this is the world that we're in nowadays. This is the sort of uh, the fast moving world that we that we're dealing with. And this is a game where, you know, real time marketing and real time insights coming through Synthesio will help drive those decisions in the right way. Great. Uh, well, it looks like we have run out of time for today. Obviously, if we have not gotten to your questions uh, that you put into the chat field, uh, some of them will reach out within the next 24 hours or so. Uh, and just a reminder, the uh, recording of this broadcast will be made available to you as well as soon as we've had time to process it and, and host it up on our website. So uh, look out for an email within the next day or so with a link to this recording and the uh, deck that we walked through today. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, David once again for joining us and uh, hope that everybody has a wonderful day. Okay, and the same for me. Thanks, Greg, and thanks for everyone that's out there listening. Uh, have a good day.